Hello, I'm Edward October. Over the years, I've narrated more ghost stories, horror shows, and creepypastas than I can count. And yet, the crimes discussed on our true crime podcast managed to scare the shit out of me. This program is not suitable for children or the faint of heart. If you are such a person, go ahead and switch off this podcast. Listen to something else. Are you still with us? Well, we've warned you. Well, hello there, Jen. Hey, Cam, how are you? I'm good. How are you? I'm doing fantastic. Here you I have really a am. case for I us. I do. Today. I have a case today, and it is a request from a man named Russell. He's a very persistent man. Thanks, um, Russell. He contacted us through Twitter and their DMs. He okay. is from the area, and he really wanted this case. So we're really going to give him the case. And we're are you really going to do it. You we got are. It. Let's go. All right. Somerville, Massachusetts is, seems like a happening kind of place. It's located just 10 minutes from Cambridge College and 15 minutes from Harvard University. The town boasts almost as many artists as New York City. And if you've ever wondered where marshmallow fluff was invented, mm. and for those that do not know what marshmallow fluff is, it's kind of like marshmallow uh, spread. It's, it's not like in little marshmallow form. It's just like a spread of marshmallow. It's like the delicious. gooey part into marshmallow, right? It's the best part. Yep. Yes. So it's marshmallow delish. fluff was invented in Somerville in 1917. And they even have a fluff festival called What the Fluff Fest, which <laughs> looks absolutely so much fun. Um, this year it's scheduled for September 23rd. So you can head to flufffestival.com to check out what it is and get more info on it. No, it looks like a blast. I, the one thing I saw that it sticks in my head is they have a marshmallow fluff hairdo contest. Holy where you use cow. the fluff. Yeah, How could to style even- hair. Get that out of your hair. A lot of hot water (laughs) and probably Dawn dishwash. It's probably pretty good for your hair, though. I bet. Maybe. I don't know. Probably not. In the densely populated area just of just four square miles, the Mystic River borders the east side of town where, according to Longfellow, Paul Revere took his midnight ride. And in 1844, Lydia Marie Child wrote... Over the river and through the woods, which was inspired river, by her crossing. Woods, to grandma's with house we go. Mm-hmm. It I'm was inspired it. by her crossing the Mystic River to get to her own grandmother's house. And her grandmother's house has been restored. Uh, it was restored in 1976 by the Tufts University, and it's located in South Street and Medford, Mass. So when you're going hmm. to the Fluff Fest, you can stop by there and check it stop out. Stop by grandma's house. Mm-hmm. And you should know this, Cam. There's also a neighborhood in Somerville called Winter Hill. <gasps> where the famous Winter Hill Gang ran yes, their organized crime operation. Yes, yep. I do. They were known for fixing horse races in the northeastern United States and shipping weapons to the IRA, which is the Irish Republican Army. Wow. And hmm. who's one of the most infamous Irish bosses Woody. from that area? Woody. Whitey, I mean. Sorry. <laughs> I was thinking Woody. Sorry. Nope. You're Whitey. always thinking about Woody. Woody. <laughs> All right. Uh, yep. Uh, James Whitey Bulger. He was the most infamous Irish mob boss. He's not uh, a very nice person. No. He it's fled really Boston not. in 1994, which is a year before this case takes place. And he'd fled because there was a pending federal indictment against him. And he was on the top. That'll do it. Yep. He was on the FBI's top 10 most wanted list. And uh, he was arrested in Santa Monica, California, June 22nd, 2011. And he had a $2 million bounty on his head. And then at at the ripe old age of 89, he was killed in his cell at the United States Penitentiary in Hazleton on October 30th, 2018. Mm. Did you want to add your little piece of trivia on here? Well, that little trivia I have for you, because, you know, I'm obsessed with mafia stuff. Uh, Whitey was transferred down there from where he had been for years, pretty much without telling anybody, family mm-hmm. members, nobody. And they were like, why are you moving him? He was dead. I believe it was three hours. He lasted three hours before Once he was Once he got killed. to his cell. Mm-hmm. 
Yep. So a little, uh, you know, I think that was kind of plan- planned out a little bit, mm-hmm. maybe. Yeah. Maybe. Just a little bit. He was uh, not very nice, though. He, uh, yeah. If you if you watch the movie Say The so. Departed, Departed, um, that's that's loosely based on all that. Yeah. Yeah. And I think there's a documentary out on him, too. Yes, there is. Mm-hmm. There is. There's several. I've seen them all. So we can say, or it's known, that the Boston area is one of the oldest historic towns in America. But in 1995, when 17-year-old Deanna Crimmin lived in Somerville, along with her mother, stepfather, two younger brothers, and one older sister named Christine, when they lived in Somerville, things were quite different. It was mockingly called Slummerville, and the community was blue-collar workers and lower middle class. Now, I always hate to say lower middle class or whatever, but I just want to remember or just want everyone to know that the current cost of living is 61% higher than the national average. It's, yeah, it's it's in the top 3% of the most expensive cities in the world. Um, St. Louis is the top 26% and LA is the top 0.4%. So it's quite Hmm. an expensive place to live. Now, Deanna worked part-time at a local convenience store called the Star Market, and she had just finished her cashier training and was excited to earn the extra money. Dina was a junior at Somerville High School, and she was one of 15 students enrolled in the high school's child development program, which was designed for students who wanted a career working with children. And one thing everybody knew about Deanna was that she loved kids. Mm -hmm. She was known as the neighborhood babysitter. And Deanna pretty much planned on a career as a nursery school teacher. She even volunteered as an actress in two children's shows that aired on Somerville Community Access Television. By all accounts, Deanna was a barrel of laughs and just fun to be around. She was always smiling and in a good mood. Her friends described their time with her as just, quote, always laughing. And Deanna was a tiny girl. She was only five foot two inches tall. She was extremely polite, but that didn't deter her from eating six slices of Leone's pizza in one sitting. (laughs) Me too, girl. Me too. Uh, Same. I wish I could say I was petite, though. Anyway, with mesmerizing green eyes and a wide beaming smile, Deanna was on her way to making a difference in the world. She had been dating her boyfriend, 19-year-old Tommy LeBanc, for about two years. And some friends wondered if it was really a good match because, you know what, Dina was very talkative. She was an extrovert and Tommy was an introvert and a bit more subdued. Now, even though some may have wondered about the match, it seemed as though they really liked each other. Deanna was particularly close to her older sister, Christine. Deanna's mother says she thinks Deanna learned to walk at just nine months old simply because she wanted to keep up with her sister. And the family often described Deanna as Christine's little shadow. Then when it came time to her little brothers, Deanna was very protective of them. She was quite the family girl, it seems. Yeah, she liked babies. Mm -hmm. On March 28th, 1995, Deanna completed a project at school in which the assignment instructed her to list five most important goals in her life. And so these were Deanna's answers. One, to graduate high school. Two, to find a successful job that I enjoy, or she enjoyed. Three, to have a dark green convertible Mustang, four, to live a happy life, five, to live a long time and healthy. And then when the assignment asked which of the five things she would choose as most important, Deanna answered to live long and healthy. But nobody could have known that when she handed in that assignment that she would not achieve those goals because she just had hours to live. Mm, It's awful. After school, Deanna decided to take the bus into the city of Boston to do some shopping since she just celebrated her birthday a few days earlier. And, of course, she had money to spend, so it was burning a hole in your pocket. Mm-hmm. Right? Remember those days. Yep. Uh-huh. I wish I had money to bur- in my pocket to burn now. I just remember getting that birthday money or Christmas money, and you're like, woohoo, let's go to the ball. Let's go. Yep. Deanna's mother, Catherine Crimmin, worked in Boston. So when her mother got off from work, Deanna met up with her mom, and the two rode the bus together. Now, some accounts say that they accidentally ended up on the same bus, and some say it was coordinated, but either way, it doesn't seem pertinent to the outcome. So once they got home, Deanna got ready to go to her boyfriend Tommy's house. And since it was a Wednesday, it was a school night, Catherine Crimmin reminded Deanna that she had a 10 p.m. curfew. Deanna promised her mother that she would be home on time. 
So soon she told her mother that she loved her and then walked to Tommy's house, which was just a half a mile away on the same street. On that night, Deanna and Tommy decided to stay in and watch TV. When Deanna realized that the show they were watching wasn't going to finish on time, you know, to make her curfew, she called her mom just to let her know that she was going to be running late. And since Deanna was usually a responsible kid, Catherine agreed. Besides, she wasn't going to be super late, and Tommy would walk her home like he always did. So Catherine sat up for a while waiting for her daughter to get home, but quickly dozed off on the couch. Catherine woke up later, probably around midnight, and there was still no sign of Deanna. This was, of course, before the days of cell phones, but Mm -hmm. Catherine had given um, Deanna a pager a few days earlier for her birthday. Yeah. Remember the pagers? I sure do. Mm -hmm. That's why I went, oh, a little wistful moment there. Yeah, And for those that don't know, pagers were like these little electronic devices where you could call the pager, put in your phone number, and then it would beep that little box that people wore on their belt or wherever. And for you to call them back. The only people that had pagers back in the day before everybody was doctors, right? For the 911 page to come into emergency or whatever. And then, yeah. And then it kind of got a little bit more popular. I never had one, though. I did for work, but I tried to ignore it. Now, Catherine was a little annoyed at Deanna for being later, even later than what she said she was going to be. So she, Catherine, paged Deanna. Well, Deanna didn't respond to the page. And even though Catherine was a little bit miffed at her daughter, she wasn't really worried since Deanna occasionally fell asleep at a friend's house and stayed the night and stayed out all night. So Catherine didn't follow up on the unanswered page, and she just assumed that Deanna would be home in the morning, and if not, it would mean that she was headed straight to school. The next morning, Catherine got up and got ready for work, expecting Deanna to come through the door at any minute. And she didn't. Catherine called Tommy's house and told him to tell Deanna to get her butt home. Mm -mm. Well, that's when Tommy informed her that Deanna wasn't there and that he had Mm -hmm. walked her halfway home the night before and he hadn't seen her since. So Catherine told her husband, Michael, Deanna's stepdad, to call the high school once school started to make sure Deanna was there. And then Catherine left to catch the train to her job at the Red Cross in Boston. Michael called Somerville High School a little while later, and he was informed that Deanna was not in school, and he wasn't sure what to do. Should he go to Tommy's to see what in the world was going on? He figured he should probably call Catherine at work, and just as he was trying to figure out in what order to do things in, there was a knock on the door. Mm-mm. Michael found police officers standing on his doorstep, and they broke the news to Michael that Deanna's body had been found less than a quarter mile from her home. Oh. Not knowing how to break the news to Catherine over the phone, Michael called her at work and told her that she needed to come home. Catherine immediately left work and beginning the long, stressful ride on the train, feeling as though her life was about to change forever. Upon arriving at her home, there were police cars and officers everywhere, but she knew as soon as she saw Michael that the news was not good. You can only imagine her, Mm-mm. Mm-mm. how her heart just sank. And that train ride at home, how would terrible. Been the worst. Awful. While walking to school, two young girls happened upon Deanna's body at 8 a.m. Deanna's body was laying face up beneath a tree at 125 Jacques Street. And I believe the locals call it Jake Street. But anyway, it was behind an apartment complex for senior citizens located a quarter mile from her own home. It appeared that she had been dead since the previous night, but it was unclear if she had been killed in the same location where she had been found or if the crime had occurred elsewhere and her body had been placed at this location. What was clear was that her body was not hidden in some remote location. The killer made no attempt to hide her remains. Where her body was found is densely populated, and in 1995 there were about 75,000 people who lived in the four square miles of Somerville. So who on earth would be so brazen as to assault her there and even just dump her body there? especially when the Mystic River was just a short distance to the east, and numerous parks throughout the Boston area would have been a little bit more secluded. Sadly, the two elementary school teachers who found Deanna's body were friends of hers. Deanna was their babysitter. Oh, that's traumatic. I mean, it's pretty much traumatic to find a body at any age, but to have it be somebody that you know at that age, yeah. Mm Mm-mm. Police initially told the family that Deanna had died of a drug overdose. And the family couldn't believe that because Deanna was not a drug user, nor were any of her friends. One of Deanna's pants legs had been pulled almost completely off, 
and one of her socks was missing. It was obvious that a violent struggle had occurred, so it's unclear why police first thought she died of a drug overdose or why they would even report that to her family when they didn't know for sure. Yeah. Later, the autopsy. Nope, go ahead. I'm sorry. They just assumed it, I guess. Since she's a young kid, but I don't know. Later, the autopsy would show that Deanna had been strangled and sexually assaulted. While Deanna didn't live a high-risk lifestyle, she was your typical teenager who, on occasion, behaved at odds with her parents. But there was nothing that made anybody think that Deanna would have been in the company of drug dealers or any type of criminal element. After interviewing the family, the police immediately started to interview the neighbors, hoping that somebody either heard something or somebody would have had any kind of idea who would want to hurt Deanna. Police zeroed in on Deanna's boyfriend, Tommy LeBlanc, because as we all know, that's usually, you know, who you go after first, right? Mm, Yep. He was the last person to see her alive and should have walked her home. But according to Catherine, Tommy always had, on every occasion, walked Deanna all the way home. And then he would call her when he returned to his house. But that night, he told investigators he only walked her halfway. He said he left her at the intersection of Heath and Bond Streets. And incidentally, her body was found just 475 feet away from that intersection. A lot of people were quick to suspect Tommy. They felt it just way too convenient that the one night he didn't walk her all the way home was the night she would be raped and murdered. And the most problematic part of his account was why he hadn't called Deanna's house when he returned to his own home like he always did. Why did things change suddenly? Many believed it was because he knew that she wouldn't be there to answer. The police never formally listed him as a suspect, but never really ruled him out either. They Mm. felt that Tommy's change in behavior on the night of Deanna's death was problematic. But Tommy said he hadn't walked Deanna all the way home because it was late when the show ended and he hadn't eaten any dinner. So he ordered food. Now, Deanna didn't want to wait for the food to arrive because she wanted to head home. She was late. So Tommy only walked her halfway because he needed to be back to his house to meet the delivery driver. He was even able to produce a receipt for the food. And according to some sources, he also had a friend over the night who gave him an alibi. And even, Hmm. yeah, his friend is named, but I'm keeping all those names out. But I will give you a link where you can find all of them in the show notes. Now, it's possible that he ate his dinner and started talking to his friend and forgot to call her, or he realized enough time had passed that she'd probably be asleep. No information on whether the pizza delivery guy was interviewed or if it was actually Tommy who paid for the pizza, or at least it hasn't been made publicly available that we could find. I mean, Mm -hmm. honestly, this thing is nothing. When you go to the Internet, all you really find are the bare bones of the case and tons of speculation. Hmm. That's it. Like, the police have kept this... Pretty close to their chest. I mean, it's an open investigation. It's still Mm -hmm. open. After speaking with several of Deanna's friends, the police learned that a Somerville firefighter had been interested in pursuing a relationship with her. How old was he? Twice her age. I'm going to get to that, right? Okay. (laughs) I was just like, wait, she's in high school and she's a firefighter? (laughs) Yeah. Deanna had a few friends would often pass the fire station on their way home from school in the afternoon. And sometimes they stopped and flirted with the firemen, many of whom were twice her age. The firefighter in question is rumored to come from a politically prominent family in the area. Oh. It's oh. also rumored that he liked teenage girls, even though oh. he was pushing 40. Oh. And there are lots of rumors, like I said, speculating as to whether or not Deanna has actually gone out with his firefighter at some point. But mm-hmm. without documentation from the police confirming that, it doesn't seem very helpful. But I will say, if I may, that if... There is a podcast called Dirty Old Boston, and the Mm. host interviewed Catherine, her mother. And Catherine has said that that the fireman was teaching Deanna how to drive and that Deanna's little brother saw them kiss. Oh. So if you want to go check it out, go do it. It gives Catherine's backstory and everything. It's pretty, it's very interesting. The episode was released on March 12th of 2020. Oh, pandemic. Okay. Mm Mm-hmm. More than 1,000 people crammed into St. Polycarp Church to say goodbye to Deanna Crimmins on the 3rd of April, 1995, including her boyfriend, Tommy. Deanna's friends wore purple ribbons, which was her favorite color, in her memory. And uh, the sadness overwhelmed most of her classmates. The spot where Deanna's body was found 
was now a shrine covered with flowers and stuffed animals. The community was not only shocked and outraged, but they were genuinely sad and in total disbelief. As the cars lined up for her funeral possession, some of her friends played Billy Joel's Only the Good Die Young on their car stereos. Still without any solid leads or suspects, the day after Deanna was laid to rest, the Somerville Police Department and the Middlesex District Attorney's Office released a sketch of a person of interest who was seen in the area where Deanna's body was found. They stressed that the man was not a suspect, but might have witnessed something pertinent to the investigation. And the police urged the man to come forward. He was described as a white male, 40 to 45 years old, around 5 foot 10 inches tall, weighing approximately 160 to 170 pounds. No information on who witnessed this person has been made public. Did he never came forward? Or we don't know yet? The person who saw the, this person that gave the composite ah. has not been identified. Gotcha. A week after Deanna's murder, detectives told reporters that they had interviewed over 100 people, many of them more than once, and followed up on dozens of leads. They had not officially named any suspects, but they had also not ruled anybody out, and they were unwilling at that point to comment on whether they questioned the fireman. In an effort to keep leads coming in, the family offered a $10,000 reward for information leading to the arrest and conviction of the person responsible for killing Deanna. The reward was funded by donations and profits from the sale of purple ribbons and t-shirts. Eventually, the reward was raised to 20000 but there was still no progress on the case. After Deanna's murder, Tommy LeBlanc, his behavior began to change. And while mm-hmm. Tommy didn't seem to have a motive for killing Deanna, and the fact that he'd never formally been named as a suspect and had an alibi, a lot of people thought he was guilty of the crime all the same. Two months after the murder, Tommy's mother, Susan LeBlanc, filed a restraining order against him. Now, according to his mother, Tommy hadn't been the same since he lost his girlfriend and was having difficulty dealing with his grief and dealing with the fact that many people thought he was guilty of the crime. He began having violent mood swings, and even though he'd never been physically violent towards her, nor had he ever hurt her, he had become verbally abusive. Hmm. Susan just felt that he was out of control. And she thought that if she filed the restraining order, it would make him seek professional counseling. Now, it's unclear if he ever received that counseling, but his mother eventually withdrew her restraining order request. However, Catherine Crimmin claims that her lawyer told her that the restraining order had been unrelated to Deanna's case. Deanna's birthday and anniversary of her death occurred within days of each other, and Deanna's mother, Catherine, found herself in a downward spiral. She had just lost her job because she couldn't stop crying at work. She began drinking excessively, and her marriage fell apart. Deanna's stepfather, Michael, would later die at just 58, quote-unquote, a broken man, and it's reported that the death of Deanna haunted him. More and more pressure and responsibility were put into Deanna's 18-year-old sister, Christine, to help. After all, there were two young boys in the family who still needed to be raised, and Christine basically took over the role of their mother. She would later tell reporters that it felt like her entire family had died. I don't think people really understand the. I don't. I'm still reeling over the the sorrow goes. The the mom got fired. Like, come on, Mm -hmm. poor thing. Have have a heart, people. In 2005, investigators gave the family false hope when they announced that they had tested forensic evidence in Deanna's case with new technology and felt that this would lead to an arrest. However. Nothing really ever came of the new technology. No arrests were made and no suspects were named. After many years of succumbing to her depression, drug and alcohol addiction, Catherine Crimmin managed to save herself. And as she did so, she became more invested in solving Deanna's murder. I do. She became much more outspoken in her accusations towards Deanna's boyfriend, Tommy LeBlanc. Every year on the anniversary of Deanna's death, 
her friends and family mark it with a prayer service and an event called Walk Deanna Home. They walk the Uh same half mile route Deanna would have walked on the night of her death. In 2013, more than 400 people participated in the anniversary march. However, Tommy wasn't one of them. He has never participated in a memorial for Deanna other than her funeral. Whether that's because he fears of what his presence would evoke, because he's got something to hide, or that he simply doesn't care, it's not clear. But to Catherine, it speaks volumes. The crowd that gathered that year marched to where Tommy lived at the time and stood silently in front of his house, staring up at the house. And in Catherine's mind, Tommy, who had only been 19 then, was responsible for her daughter's death, either because he killed her or neglected to walk her all the way home. She feels Deanna would still be alive if he walked her to her doorstep. However, if Deanna had been chosen and watched by her killer, like somebody who wasn't Tommy, he would have also had plenty of ample opportunities to kill her. If her killer were determined to get his way with her, Tommy walking Deanna all the way home that night would have only delayed the inevitable. Uh In 2017, the Somerville Police Department and DA announced that they had new evidence in the Deanna Crimin case that claimed the mayor or administration at the time of Deanna's murder allegedly may have been involved in a stall tactic and stifled the investigation. Mm, But nothing new has come of this information either. So 28 years on, the police have still never officially named any suspects in this case. Three persons of interest have been announced. Deanna's boyfriend, Tommy, an unnamed firefighter, which if you look hard enough, you can find the name, and another man who was later imprisoned in Massachusetts Correctional Institution in Cedar Junction. That particular man was in jail for rape, and he claimed that he hadn't killed Deanna, but he gave the police a lot of detail on how he would have done it if it would have been him. And as far as we can find in newspapers, his identity has never been revealed, nor has it been revealed why the police suspected him in the first place, other than that he was a convicted rapist living in the area at the time. But I will say, according to Reddit, (laughs) his nickname, I'm not going to divulge his real name, but his nickname is uh, Vinny No Shoes. Vinny No Shoes. I'm going to guess no that's shoes. because he doesn't wear shoes? Yes. Mm-hmm. Gotcha. No, it's uh, from what I've heard on another podcast. I think it was, was it True Crime Garage? I listened to True Crime Garage and the trail went cold on this because I wanted more information. Everything is just, like I said, it's all There's speculation, there. right? Yeah. yeah. According to True Crime Garage, Vinny No Shoes is Vinny No Shoes because he would take girls to his apartment and have them take their shoes off and then jump up and down. But Ew. whether that's true or not, I don't know. That was just according to oh. True Crime Barrage. Weird. So Reddit does give him the real name, and I'm not going to say it because the man served his time for rape, and he's not really a suspect, or that he might be a suspect, but I don't know, right? We don't know. Yeah, we don't know. But according to Catherine Crimmins, <laughs> his DNA was tested and it came back inconclusive. And that's in the old Dirty Boston podcast, too. It's not clear what forensic evidence police possess on the rape and murder of Deanna because the police have not really released any information. But many other sites have said that the DNA that was collected was DNA under Deanna's nails and other parts of her body. They do have DNA. They do have DNA. Uh Right. Okay. And it's not, can't they rule out like the boyfriend and stuff? That's the thing. There's no information on that. Like, okay. there's nothing. Like, I mean, they the have, boyfriend... we know that they have DNA. We know what it is, but that's it. I mean, I mean the boyfriend at least not that I can find. Yeah. The boyfriend wouldn't have to give his DNA, but also they were in a relationship. So that's very possible that they had relations that night. That night. Exactly. So. Exactly. So it's very much a, it's a gray area there. Mm-hmm. Right. Yes. So the police and the DA had stated on a few occasions that they feel that they know who killed Deanna. They just don't have enough evidence to arrest him. Ugh, that's terrible. And there's no statutes of limitation to murder in the United States, as we know, but a person cannot be tried twice for the same crime. So it's kind of understandable why they want to ensure that they have enough evidence for a conviction. Mm-hmm. But the clock's ticking and justice needs to be served. Yes, it does. For Deanna's family, the wait is excruciating. And by 2014, a reward for information leading to the arrest was raised to $50,000. And every year, her family erects a billboard with her photo and information on it. And the bottom of the billboard says, quote, 
You know what you did to me. How much longer must I wait? Please help make my time in heaven restful. This billboard was meant to strike right at the heart of her killer, who apparently either has no conscience or has moved out of the area or is no longer alive. Or he's just keeping his mouth shut because he knows what a terrible thing he did. Mm -hmm. Trees and benches all over town bear the name of Deanna. Deanna Crimin Square was erected at the junction of Jock and Temple Streets in honor of her. There's a $500 scholarship that's given out every year in Deanna's name to one student enrolled in the child development program at Somerville High School. There's a playground that was renamed in her honor as well. Willie Alexander, a former keyboard player and member of a rock band, Velvet Underground, oh, yeah. who is a native of Gloucester, Massachusetts, wrote a song about her death called Who Killed Deanna, which appeared on his album, The East Main Street Suite, which was released in 1999 and the Dog Bar Yacht Club released in 2005. In this case, the reward for information leading to arrest has now reached 70000 which is a life-changing amount of money for some people. Yes, it is. Unfortunately, the family has not finished suffering tragedy. Mm -mm. On March 8, 2017, Deanna's older sister, Christine, who had sacrificed so much of her youth to help raise her younger brother, who helped raise her younger brothers, passed away. She even left behind one son of her own. Hmm. Christine was just 40 years old. Deanna's two younger brothers are now grown, and they have families of their own. One of them gave his daughter the middle name of Deanna in honor of his sister. And so much has changed in Somerville since Deanna's passing. The church where her funeral was held is now an affordable housing unit, and the mall where she would shop is gone. But one thing is still there, and that's the love that the community has for her. So. If you have any information on the rape and murder of Deanna Crimin, please contact the Somerville Police Department at 617-625-1600, or there's a confidential tip line for Deanna's case at 617-544-7167, because there's so much that has been taken from her and her family that if you can, let's help them find some peace. I can't believe somebody hasn't blabbered. You know, something. It's hard to believe people can keep their mouth that shut. Exactly. You know what I mean? You would you think did something the guilt terrible. would. You would think that, but we're normal. See, that's the that's the issue. We I wouldn't know. do that in the first place. I don't know. I mean, Catherine Crimin really leans hard on Tommy. She said that she's read a bunch through his letters mm -hmm. or letters that he had sent to Deanna. Mm -hmm. And she kind of thinks that he was obsessed with her. Um, oh. Shessa said that Tommy refused to take a polygraph, which is, I understand that. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Um, and he also refused to answer questions when he was put before a grand jury. He pled the fifth on a lot of things, which doesn't necessarily make you guilty either. Yeah, I get that. But also, I don't know, like if you're innocent and you, I would be like, okay, I'm going to do what I can, can to clear my name so you can move on, get off me and go find the person right. that did it. But also we know how many people are unfairly... Uh, incarcerated and did not do it. I mean, we hear right. about that just about once a week, somebody right. getting out or somebody fighting. So, yeah. And in that interview on the podcast, um, Catherine claims that Deanna was going to break up with Tommy that night. Oh, see, that's what I was wondering about that. Yeah. Mm -hmm. she, I don't know. I mean, that's what she claims. If he did have anger management issues, he could have gotten upset with her. And that's mm -hmm. why he didn't only walk her halfway home or... Mm -hmm. And then strangled her. But it takes four to five minutes to strangle. You'd think, I don't know, to kill somebody with strangulation. It takes that long. That's a long time. So how um, old is he today, give or take? Uh, 30, almost something like that. I don't know. Camille, damn it. I know. I'm just curious. Let's see. I'm he was 19 at the time. I think it's been like 28 years. 17 oh. carried the one. He's like almost 50. He's okay. like 47 years old. Hmm. So, yeah. But... Again, if he would kill her, you would think that he'd be smart enough to cover his tracks and call her just to pretend, right? Because if yeah, that was unless the... you were so upset, like if it wasn't planned out, he would be super freaked out. You know what I mean? If it was planned out, it'd be different. But uh, if you're not, if that's not something you were planning to do that evening, and you did it, you know what I'm saying? He's got an alibi for that night. His friend supposedly came over, or he went to a friend's house. It's unclear. I've heard two different versions of it. Remember, two can't keep a secret, right? One's going to talk. Well, and I want to know, too, the police, if they think they know who did it, 
Who? Tell us. Just call Jen and Cam and tell us. You don't <laughs> tell know. anybody else. I know. I'm, I mean, it's beyond bizarre. And unfortunately, it happens a lot where, you know, they just don't have enough evidence where they can't yeah. convict somebody. No. And you can't, you don't want to do that because then they'd, they could for real come out and say they did it after right. they were. That kind of makes me feel that they feel that it's Tommy. Well, I was just kind of thinking that if it, you know, police officers can say things without saying things. I don't know. If it was his DNA found on her, like is claimed, I mean, it could easily be Mm -hmm. said in a court of law that they were boyfriend and girlfriend Mm -hmm. of two years. They were together for two years. Mm -hmm. So that could be explained away. So it's very frustrating. If they I don't know. I'm just thinking out loud here. So don't don't come at me. Don't at me. But if I mean, this has been years. Give the mother some peace my god Mm -hmm. so i would think maybe police would kind of indicate to her well we know we can't rule out this person but we know it's not this person or there's you know what i'm saying i would think that they would be like they can't say who they think it is but i think that they could say who they believe who it's not i don't think they can but i mean i think after this many years if you i don't know maybe that's just me wishful thinking thinking that Maybe if one of them turns up dead sometime that they can say, well, he was the suspect that we mm-hmm. had. I don't know. I don't know how that works. But all I know is my heart goes out to the Kremen family. I mean, poor Catherine. Really, I strongly suggest everybody go to that episode of Old Dirty Boston and just listen to her. Like her life. Well, yeah. that's, you can't, every other buddy's life's ruined. You can't. Well, she's <sighs> had a difficult life. So, and, so why? And this just tops it off. Yeah. She's lost everyone, you know? Mm. So it's. I have questions. Oh, there's lots of questions. Oh, I know. I get it. And that's what's so frustrating because you go and you get like these bare bones. I mean, the police are keeping all this under wraps. I mean, so you know the bare details. Well, here's but the thing. Too. Everything else is speculation. So, and hearsay. So there's not which is, like. Which is what we're doing and we shouldn't. But let me exactly. add this. Let me add this. So, like, if they have DNA, say, semen, and he said, we had relations, we had sex Mm -hmm. that night before, there would only be one set of semen there. Well, if she was raped, there'd be two sets if it wasn't him. Do you see what I'm saying? Yeah. So, I need to know that. I need to have somebody call me. she could have not, they could have just thought she was sexually assaulted. But actually, it was just her and her boyfriend having consensual sex. Or it was so roughed up and the position of her body indicated otherwise. Right. I would think that they were, I think but before if making was, that assumption, I think that they would know, they would say that she was sexually assaulted. But if it was Tommy, why would he kill her out in the middle of the open? Because they were in a fight. He didn't mean to. Maybe he hit her and then he freaked out. And I don't know. Who knows? Why do people do it all the time? And then drag her 500 feet from where sh- they were. Mm-hmm. to another open part like this was all out in the open with a, you know yeah. what i mean it's just mm-hmm. weird that nobody saw anything or heard anything but it was late at night right or it was, was probably a... we don't know i mean she was supposed to be home at 10 it was going to be late her later mm-hmm. and we don't know what time it was it was a school night as far as i know i couldn't find any information on when she was walked home when tommy walked her halfway home mm-hmm. but it was a school night she was supposed to be home at 10 they were watching, I believe, one of her favorite shows. She wanted to watch it. It was running late. Did he for sure walk her home at all? Like, could he have said he walked her halfway home? I don't know. He could and have. Then she didn't. He didn't walk her at all. He could have. That could be it. Because that would be. You wouldn't want to say I got mad at her, so I didn't walk her home, and then she was brutally murdered. Because but we don't even know they got. He got mad at her. We no, don't I know don't. anything. <clears throat> it's all speculation. That's yeah. you know. All right. Well, the person who did it needs to come forward. Seriously. It's time. Like, come on. What you've already had, you've already lived a good part of your life that mm-hmm. she never had, especially if you're the fireman that he's even, what, 20 years older than the boyfriend. Yeah, he'd be in his 60s. Retired now, probably. Wouldn't you just like every time you closed your eyes, if you were the person that did that, how could you like, I, I think I would go insane because that's all I would see. That's mm-hmm. all I would think about. Ugh. Yeah. And it could just be some crime of opportunity that somebody yep. saw her walking and just... Yep. You know, it couldn't be anyone. But it was, I just think it was weird that the one, which I think it's Vinny No Shoes, was the one that said, well, it's kind of like OJ. I didn't do it, but if I did, if here's I, did. I would do it. Mm-hmm. Yeah. So 
I don't, don't know. But and do, his DNA came back inconclusive per Catherine Crimmins. So they huh. couldn't rule him out nor say that he did it. Or I guess they could rule him out. I don't know how that works. No. I'm going to be honest with you. Inconclusive means it didn't go either way. But right. why why wouldn't they test him again then uh, or test her? So mm, the DNA they found off her. Mm-hmm. I don't know. But I, don't know, I think so, the whole thing that the police knows. I think they know. Mm-hmm. Wouldn't if you were a policeman too, if you thought this, I would, I would stalk and badger and annoy that person. <laughs> like I would probably get a restraining order called on myself because I would show up at the grocery store right next to the person. Hi, Bob. How are you? And then at church, Bob, how are you? Right? Like mm-hmm. I, because I, I would want to put the pressure on and say, you're going to mess up. It might not be today. It might not be tomorrow. It might not be next year, but one day you're going to break because I'm following you and I'm on it. And then if it happened that you were wrong, then you just terrorized somebody for. Yeah. But, you know, I didn't hurt him. Like, say Tommy, let's say Tommy is innocent. Like, his life has been completely ruined. Mm -hmm. And I have to move out of state or can't even move out of state because there's podcasts and Reddit. You'd have to change your name. Yeah. You would but that think. happens all the time, you know. But if you're it's innocent, sad. but if you're innocent, would you? You know, I would. If I'm you not... wanted to live a normal life and say, "Oh God," you get a new job and somebody's like, "Where have I heard Tommy LeBlanc's name?" Mm-hmm. Let me Google that, and that's the first thing you popped up the, on Google, right? Yeah, yeah. I mean, that's that's a shadow that you're never going to get rid of. I mean, it's going to follow you around everywhere. That's why the speculation is so horrible because. I mean, already, look, Deanna, Deanna's life was taken. All of her family's lives were, were ruined, were, you know, totally upheaved, mm-hmm. right? And now Tommy, who may or may not be innocent, he's facing his life's ruined, whether he did it or not. I don't yeah. know. I don't know either. It's heartbreaking. It's terrible. It is. All there, yeah. And we were talking about before we even did this episode that, you know, how do you feel about unsolved crimes like covering it and you and i are both like we hate them but yeah it's just because they need to be said yeah and they need to be solved so there they're not go. unsolved any longer exactly. right they're frustrating to us because we like closure but i can't imagine how frustrating it is for the family mm-hmm. of people in these unsolved Mm-mm. cases Mm-mm. Mm-mm. so anyway that is the case of Dina Crimmins. Do we have a uh, promo this week? We, we do. do from our good friends, JT and Mike from Brew Crime. They finally sent us the promo, like they said, and we are finally, finally. playing it. Finally. Yes. So anyway, we love Mike and JT. They're great guys. And They're we get to meet. Brew Crime. We get to meet Mike this year at where? True Crime and Paranormal Podcast Festival. Yes. Is that what in it's Austin, called? Texas. They changed in, the name. Yep. In Austin, Texas. We will be there at the end of August. I was hoping it'd be Austis, Texas, like you just said. I think Austis, that'd be more. Yeah. Austis, I'm Texas. You. I'm it's fighting pretty. a headache right now as we speak. So, yeah. All right. Well, let's wrap it up. But thanks for making uh, fun of me. It's okay. It's what I'm here for. It's what I'm here for. All right. Until next time. Remember, lock your doors. And keep passing by those open windows. Uh, bye-bye. Love ya. For more information about this episode, as well as all other sources, please check out our show notes or the podcast website at OurTrueCrimePodcast.com. Our True Crime Podcast is developed and created by the hosts, Jen and Cam. Original music and audio mix of all Our True Crime Podcast episodes is courtesy of Nico Vertese from We Talk of Dreams. You can reach Nico at wetalkofdreams.com. Listener discretion is provided by Edward October from October Pod VHS. You can find all of his great works on YouTube. Please make sure to like and subscribe to our True Crime Podcast wherever you listen to your podcasts. We can be reached on Instagram and Facebook at our True Crime Podcast or on Twitter with the handle at our True Crime Pod. You can also email us at our True Crime Podcast at gmail.com. We would also at this time like to thank our patrons. We would be so lost without you. Thank you so much. And if you would like to help support the show, you can check us out on patreon.com slash our true crime podcast. 
You can also show your support by leaving a five-star review on Apple or simply just tell your friends about us. It's that easy. Love ya. Welcome to Brew Crime, a true crime and beer podcast. This is a podcast where we pick a theme, cover a few cases, and pair them with craft beer. Join me, Mike. And me, JT. As we explore the world of crime, conspiracies, or whatever catches our attention. You can find us on social media at Brew Crime or our website, brewcrime.com. And you can find us on any podcast app at Brew Crime Podcast. Join us as we discuss the horrible crimes that surround us and maybe, eh, probably, nah, definitely tip a bottle or two back as you do it. Drink with us the second and last Tuesday of every month.